Hi everyone, welcome back. No, oh, actually, make sure I don't leak audio from the hallway track. Um, welcome back from our break. Um, our next talk is going to be uh, Jason from DeepSet talking about using FreeBSD in an enterprise environment. So I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Awesome, John. Can you hear me okay? Yep, looking good. Great. Well, hope everyone had a wonderful break and uh, thanks so much for the time to speak to the group today. Um, super excited to share a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, having been a, a FreeBSD user for, she's probably going on 15, 16 years now. Uh, much like many people, I started out as a uh, hobbyist and found myself throughout the years working with uh, various different operating systems and enterprise environments, um, mainly focused in the payment space. So DeepStack is a payment processing company. Uh, we do credit card ACH processing and getting very frustrated with some of the other operating systems that, that we were working with because of all of the mysterious random error codes and black boxes and support tickets. And I had a uh, colleague of mine um, in college that said, hey, you need to give FreeBSD a look and an opportunity. So I started playing around with it and absolutely fell in love with the simplicity of configuration and standardization of the operating system and decided to build or rebuild our company at the time on top of the FreeBSD uh, stack as an operating system. And uh, we were very successful in doing that. We, we launched our entire uh, product. This was back in 2008, um, not DeepStack, but a, a different company on top of FreeBSD and uh, continued to use that operating system in various companies and uh, projects since that day. And one of the, the challenges that I have always run into with FreeBSD um, especially dealing with regulated, uh, you know, banks and, and different organizations, uh, and a lot of security standards is it is not known, uh, by a lot of security standards as a enterprise grade operating system, even though it is fully capable of it. And I have spent countless hours over the years talking to auditors, um, infosec guys, uh, CIOs, CISSPs on why we use FreeBSD in the enterprise environment and making that business case for it. So that's why when invited to uh, speak with the group, I said, I think this is a, a perfect topic to discuss because FreeBSD at its core is a tremendous operating system that is more than capable and in some ways better than other operating systems when you're dealing in enterprise environments. So this is a, a topic I'm very passionate about. Um, we have put our environment through countless audits from uh, an info security standpoint and have passed them with flying colors. Um, and in a lot of cases uh, had to teach various auditing companies um, or assessment companies about FreeBSD, right? They've, they've heard of Windows, they've heard of uh, Unix, but I'm sorry, of Linux uh, distros, but they never really had experience with FreeBSD before. So it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, I hope that the takeaways from this session uh, enable and arm some people that are utilizing FreeBSD in uh, varying capacities across uh, different industries, different types of organizations that are faced with the challenge of explaining to somebody who is not familiar with FreeBSD why it should be classified and uh, why it qualifies as a enterprise grade operating system that is you know, capable of passing regulatory scrutiny. So uh, let's first talk a little bit about our environment. I, I think this will kind of set the stage for just the, the complexity of it. Um, as I said, we're in the payments processing space. Uh, we deal with millions of credit card numbers, account numbers that 
uh, all require, you know, extreme security and protection. Um, you know, a, a, a data breach is something that would be insanely bad for us. And we go through extensive lengths and penetration testing, vulnerability management against our environment um, on, a, on a daily basis, as a matter of fact, to keep it as rock solid as possible. Uh, today, we currently have close to 60 servers across two different data centers in the United States. Uh, that environment is active active. We have our own IPv4 block that we any cast. Um, I think we are probably one of few payments technology companies that actually anycast the platform uh, so that you're always connecting to the lowest top. Um, and, and within that environment, there are several uh, VLANs that are all segmented. Uh, there's massive segmentation in our environment to isolate areas of the infrastructure where uh, unencrypted cardholder data exists in memory um, and also make sure that the uh, e even the encrypted cardholder data that is persisted to files is stored in a highly secured and audited way. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're not just concerned about uh, preventing some sort of attack, but also in the event that somebody were able to compromise an environment that we have the necessary auditing, logging, and uh, forensics in place for business continuity, disaster recovery, and incident response. So there's a few areas that I'm gonna focus on that I think are the most common questions that I see when uh, talking to auditors, assessors, and uh, security folks that are not familiar with FreeBSD when you're trying to make a business justification for using FreeBSD in the enterprise environment. Um, the first is security and stability, followed by high availability, patching, configuration management, and compliance. So let's start with security and stability. One of the things that I think is the most incredible thing about using FreeBSD and most of the products that go along or are installed on FreeBSD is they're all open source. And there's a, a to some degree, a stigma against open source in the enterprise environment. And I think it's very unfounded for two reasons. One, working with open source software eliminates all the black boxes. There's no mysteries on how things work. You can always look at it, understand the code, dig all the way down the rabbit hole and see what's going on under the hood. And secondly, and I think more importantly than closed source type solutions, when a product is open source and the source code is available, it's much easier to develop exploits for it. There's a lot more eyes on it things tend to be found and patched much quicker than closed source where it, it's kind of a black box and a very small group of people know how it actually functions and, and what's happening under the hood. Um, secondly, I have never seen an operating system that has more of a consistent behavior from release and patch cycle to release and patch cycle. We, we have all, you know, working with other operating systems, you you install an update and all of a sudden a whole bunch of tools no longer work because some underlying library changed. The beauty of FreeBSD, the ports collection, uh, the package management system is every time you're upgrading your software, uh, you're you're upgrading the operating system, it's very easy to rebuild everything against that new operating system and not deal with things that are constantly breaking. Uh, another huge advantage, and this isn't a lot of security control or a lot of security frameworks, is making sure that what's running on the system is only critical things that need to be running on the system. And I love the fact that FreeBSD, the base install, has a very minimal set of services that are enabled and that are exposed 
to the outside world. Um, and, and I'm seeing a couple of questions come in. I'm, I'll tackle those uh, at the end, but uh, uh, as many of them as I can in a live fashion. So feel free to keep sending them in. Um, so yeah, minimum base install, it, it, rather than installing an operating system and have to, having to deconfigure a whole bunch of services, FreeBSD out of the box, it's very easy to add on what you need and not have to worry about uninstalling or disabling a whole bunch of services. Um, additionally, it's very easy to tune, right? The, the sys control settings allow you to tune just about every aspect of how the network stacks run, how uh, intrusion detection runs. It's, it, it, and it, it, it's very well documented. Um, it, it's very frustrating trying to figure out how to change a specific behavior of the operating system. And I think a lot of closed sourced operating systems, they have all of these, these magic you know, settings that you can go apply that are very poorly documented or, and most of the time you find out about them because some support person at gave somebody in a ticket, oh, go, go do this thing. And nobody really knows what that thing does. With FreeBSD, that's entirely demystified, very easy to, to configure and tune and very well documented. Next is performance. Um, I, I, you know, I, I saw a, uh, a sequence diagram once, and, and I think it was, uh, it wasn't FreeBSD, but I think it was Apache versus a um, commercial web server. And just the sheer number of uh, calls that are happening under the hood, right, in order to serve up a, a single web page. And I, and I think this parlays on the open source factor, right? In that diagram, the closed source product that had a you know tremendous amount of code that just kind of lingered around forever um, had two to three more or two to three more times calls back to kernel libraries, uh, disk IO, memory IO than that open source Apache library. And I, and I think that you know that's just the nature of developers, right? We're very concerned about performance. We're very concerned about uh, things running as efficiently as possible. And I think as a derivative of FreeBSD being an open source operating system, you have much better performance and you can push the, you can get the uh, significantly more bang for the buck out of the hardware with FreeBSD than you can with uh, other types of operating systems. Um, and I think lastly on the security and stability thread, one of the things that I think is uh, very, very well organized, which makes uh, compliance and regulatory uh, audits very easy to tackle, is the separation between the base operating system and the additional software that is installed uh, on that operating system. I think in, in, in many operating systems, those things get very intertwined. And the fact that within FreeBSD, you know, everything that you're installing for the most part is landing in user local as opposed to part of the base operating system makes it very easy to separate what's part of the operating system and what's installed as a add-on library. So moving on to high availability, uh, th this is, something that I have never been able to achieve with another operating system without having to go out and purchase very expensive um, firewalls and routing equipment. And uh, just as a precursor, uh, even our firewalls within our environment are FreeBSD, uh, running PF, CAR, PF Sync, and PF Log. So, we have built, uh, like I said, an, an active, active, multi-homed, any-casted platform uh, utilizing pretty much out of the box FreeBSD. Um, we're utilizing uh, CARP on the internal interfaces to um, you know, uh, move IP addresses between firewalls, right? Each, each site has multiple firewalls. 
uh, PF sync to keep all of that state uh, synchronized between the, the firewalls. Uh, PF is the actual firewall engine. Um, and the only third party application that we had to add in order to achieve that high availability configuration was BIRD, which we're using for BGP uh, session management, right? For the, the IPv4 block that we, uh, that we have. So some interesting statistics. Um, the current DeepStack platform was launched uh, about two years ago at this point. Uh, we have had zero downtime since inception, since going live with the platform. And the current configuration, we have load tested to 20,000 concurrent credit card transactions. Um, and, and, and that didn't even push the, the platform to its limits. So, you know, with, with uh, very simple hardware and very simple configuration, we were able to achieve massive high availability and fault tolerance out of the box. Patching. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and it is it is probably one of the most compelling reasons to use FreeBSD in an enterprise environment. Uh, one of the, the questions that I get all the time, and, and this particularly pertains to firewalls, is, you know, what you're using FreeBSD as your operating system for, you know, running a firewall. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of uh, auditing and assessment firms, a lot of CISSPs, um, you know, they're used to seeing the brand names out there. And, I, you know, not to devalue any of the brand names, but here's my perspective on it. One, I think a lot of the major names out there are actually using open source tools, FreeBSD, other open source operating systems, um, and, and PF under the hood, right? They have just wrapped it up, put their own logo on it, built their own UI, but under their hood, it's, it's the same thing that we're doing by hand today. Um, and I'm not a big fan of, you know, of, of user interfaces. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit further in, in the configuration side of things. But what I have seen historically, especially being in the payment processing space, and like I said, we are doing vulnerability scans on a nightly basis. We make extensive use of tools like package audit, right, which is looking for CVEs in known uh, or in, uh, in installed packages is every time we see a vulnerability that pops up, we have a patch for it before most of the big name vendors do, right? A lot of the big name vendors that are relying on open SSL under the hood, in order for somebody to patch that firewall appliance, they have to wait for the vendor to create a new firmware update, download it, install it, on their uh, on their firewall appliance, right? Within our environment, uh, we've set up a Pudria build server, which every night automatically goes and takes all of the uh, packages that we have installed, downloads the source, and rebuilds it. So most of the time, when a vulnerability pops up, we already have a freshly built uh, build for whatever piece of software that is that's already patched. And we're actually quicker in getting those security vulnerabilities patched and mitigated than a lot of the big names are out there. Uh, configuration management, um, another huge topic. I talked about how I hate user interfaces for configuration. Um, nobody likes the mysterious checkbox, right? What is it actually doing under the hood? I, you know, I, I I look at tools like PF and a lot of the the configuration tools that are built on top of it that are, you know, WYSIWYG converting a UI back to a flat file. Um, I love the beauty and simplicity of configuring FreeBSD and configuring everything that you install on top of it. Uh, everything is flat files. You don't have to log into or use user interfaces to configure and make changes. And 
that creates a very, very powerful argument when it comes to configuration management. Uh, just about every auditing and security assessment framework requires that you have some sort of change management process in place. And when you're dealing with file-based configuration, that becomes very simple in that you can diff those configuration files. You can use virgin control on those configuration files. And it almost inherently builds a change management process into how you're managing configuration. And if you want to take it a step further, we live and die by salt stack here. Um, there is not a single configuration file on any server in our entire environment that is hand tuned, hand controlled. Uh, everything is done via salt stack. That entire salt stack state table and repository is all managed by Git. Uh, it makes it very easy to track configuration and uh, change management around the entire environment, have it in a single centralized repository. And I apologize, my slides are changing on one screen and not changing on another screen. Um, that uh, a single configuration repository and have a audit trail of every change that has ever been uh, implemented on any production system. So last, um, I, I wanna talk a little bit about compliance frameworks. Um, these are two of the compliance frameworks that we uh, deal with on a, a regular basis. Um, and a lot of the these frameworks, if you if you look at the controls, are I think are very window centric. Um, and a lot of the assessors who are doing the assessments on these controls are very familiar with Windows. And that that has always been a, a big learning curve uh, when you're trying to undergo a assessment, uh, you know, a PCI level one audit, a uh, NIST cybersecurity framework audit. And a lot of the controls are written around Active Directory, right? Um, you know, FreeBSD does not have, obviously, Active Directory, right? The, the configuration is done very differently. So I think the, uh, you know, the, the topics that we discussed so far are the main topics that come up when you're going through a, uh, you know, for example, a PCI assessment um, and somebody that is not familiar with, with the FreeBSD operating system, with how it's configured, with how security happens. Um, and if, uh, if anyone is going through one of these types of assessments or, or plans to go through one of them, uh, feel free to, to reach out to me. I can refer a couple of vendors that we have previously worked with that are now familiar with FreeBSD. Uh, but I will tell you, if you find a vendor, if you find a partner on the compliance side of things, that you go through the process of doing things on FreeBSD with, that first audit, that first assessment may be more painful than future ones if they're not familiar with the operating system. But I've yet to have a, a security assessor that has gone through a FreeBSD assessment with us that at the end of that course does not think it is probably one of the most amazing operating systems from a security compliance, patch management, configuration management perspective. It, it's, it, it makes bundling everything up uh, for the assessment very easy to, to catalog, to evidence, to keep together. Um, and when you're talking about dealing with a enterprise operating system, getting through an audit, getting through an assessment around it is, is really at the end of the day what quantifies that operating system being enterprise ready. And we've done it several times. 
it is significantly easier when you're working with an auditor or an assessor that understands FreeBSD than just about every other operating system that I've ever worked with. So uh, that is my case for FreeBSD in an enterprise environment. Um, I'm gonna jump over to the, uh, the Q and A. Uh, first question I have is, can you share some of your notes on getting FreeBSD through third-party audits? I'm mostly interested on how to explain real-world security to checkbox compliance folks. Example, having split root passwords instead of disabling root passwords, uh, uh, disabling password login completely. So great question. Um, we are, uh, we've come up with a very interesting solution to this. And the way that we've done it is we've made our entire environment passwordless. Um, just about every security framework, uh, or let me rephrase that, we've made it, made it known passwordless. Just about every security framework today requires some sort of multi-factor authentication. And then there's a whole plethora of controls around password complexity, password expiration, not using the same password, um, you know, within a certain period of time. Our solution to that is we have no standard passwords. Um, we have implemented uh, time-based one-time passwords on FreeBSD. Uh, there's a very nice plugin for PAM that supports it. And effectively, it works, you know, just like you can use a uh, Authy or Google Authenticator or any type of application that you know you scan the QR code, it it lets you use a one-time password. So, you know, our answer is passwords expire every 30 seconds. Um, they're dri or, uh, they're derived off of a secret that nobody knows off the top of their head, and in conjunction with the TOTP-based uh, password we also use MFA, right? Um, and the, that second part of the MFA is public-private key authentication. So the combination of uh, something you have, the private key, and something you know, which is effectively the password or the one-time password generated from the authentication app, uh, satisfies all of the controls around passwords and MFA that we have ever run into from a security and uh, compliance type audit. So I actually have a question for you, Jason. Um, I'm aware of at least one other payments processor that uses FreeBSD, uh, Modirum in Europe. And I'm curious in your experience, if you've run into any other processors that also use FreeBSD. Um, as far as I know, uh, through, through my network, we are the only ones that are using FreeBSD holistically, um, meaning that every piece of our environment, uh, top to bottom is FreeBSD as the operating system. There's absolutely not a single server that is running any other OS or any other type of appliance. Um, I know quite a few that use it from a uh, development perspective, but uh, development perspective in development environments, um, but have not been able to get the buy-in from leadership on using it from a, uh, a production perspective. And it, and it usually boils down to a lot of the, you know, unfamiliarity with the operating system in an enterprise capacity and a lot of the uh, the types of con you know points that we've talked about today. Okay, we have another question in Zoom. Um, someone asked, "How do you enforce the four eyes principle um, technically and procedurally?" Um, so four eyes principle. Uh, and, and just for anyone who's not aware, it, it basically means that, you know, for any uh, action that's being taken, 
that there's two individuals that approve the same action before it can be taken. So the, the way that we enforce that from a configuration operating system perspective is one, uh, we run, um, so nobody has root access to any of our servers to begin with, right? You're, you're logging in as a user account. Um, and the privilege escalation, right? We use sudo once again with um, a PAM plugin and a one-time password that acts as a, uh, you know, we'll call it a break glass type of thing, right? So anytime that, that process happens, it's, it's sending out alerts um, to everybody that is part of the InfoSec team so that there is awareness that somebody effectively used the, the break glass um, logins. And, and, you know, those exist in case there's a systemic failure and the automated tools that are in place are down, don't work, something goes wrong. Uh, outside of that break glass procedure, which I would say the four eyes principle is retroactive, not proactive, everything is controlled by SALT. And SALT is responsible for deploying configuration changes to all of the servers. The way we implement the, you know, we'll, we'll call it the separation of, uh, of duties, is through the Git repositories. And any time any change is going to be made, a uh, branch is made off of that salt stack repository that maintains all of the states. And a, uh, you know, we're, we're an Atlassian shop, so we make heavily heavy use of the Atlassian products. Uh, a JIRA ticket gets created. Um, that ticket is approved by, you know, a, a uh, you know, senior system admin or by myself. Um, the change is implemented, tested in a development environment. All of those tests are artifact. And then a pull request gets created from that branch back to the master branch that requires multiple approvers. Uh, that branch can't be moved, merged into the master branch, which is ultimately how we have salt configured, right? So we uh, use get FS in get G I T F S in salt um, to pull that configuration from the master branch. And that uh, feature branch or hotfix branch cannot be merged into the master branch without multiple approvers. And that workflow is configured via uh, the Bitbucket bit controls. Well, thanks, Jason. I don't see any other questions. So I think, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting um, to hear. Oh, I guess, We've got another question that just snuck in here, which is um, they're saying, do you use the Mac subsystem, the kernel? And I think what they mean is, do you use any modules that make use of Mac? Um, I'm trying to think of ones that might be applicable. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any that you might, you might find interesting, but do you use any perhaps like kernel modules that do security checks for you? So we we use a uh, a bunch of kernel modules, um, and I will. If you give me a second here, I will pull up the list of what we're using because I do not know them off the top of my head, um, and and I'm not sure which ones of these tie to uh, to Mac or not. But I'll just kind of go through them. So we're we're using the TCP rack um, module. We're using uh, CryptoDev, um, the uh, ACCF, HTTP, and data modules. And then I know on the firewalls, uh, we're using, uh, obviously, CARP and the uh, TCP MD5 modules. 
Okay. I don't think any of those are rack or Mac related, but um, that's interesting that you're using the rack stack. That's one of the that's worked on by Netflix. Uh, did y'all find yeah. specific use cases where rack works better for you than the default stack? Overall performance and you know, th this is in conjunction with a whole bunch of uh, sys control tunables. Um, we're getting we're getting better performance using the rack stack. Okay, that's very cool. Well, I'll give another minute just in case we have any more questions again. That last one. I was thinking about stuff like see other UUIDs. Oh, oh. So these are these are different Mac modules that you can configure. Um, I guess Biba and MLS are ones that are familiar to folks who've done. I mean, I'm less familiar with them. Um, but they're used in some other in some contexts. Um, like MLS is multi-level security. Um, see other UIDs as a way to hide like processes running as different UIDs from each other, I think. But it may not, I don't know. Yeah, I, I know, I know we have, um, you know, processes hidden. Um, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the other two modules. Um, our, you know, our, our production environment is very well segmented, meaning that every every server only has a uh, single function. So we're we're not running multiple service daemons on the same uh, on, on the same server. And and the reason for that is, you know, if there was a compromise at a certain at a certain layer, your you know, trying to lim limit that compromise and what it would have access to. Um, so based on the, the fact that no, no server is running multiple services or, or that are, that are being exposed, um, we've never really dug into isolating services from other services other than we don't run any services unless absolutely necessary under the root user, right? There's a there's a uh, separate user that's created that once the application starts up, it's ch rooted to that particular user as opposed to running under root. Okay, I do think some of these modules are kind of yeah, they're 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 focused on if you're running concurrent services, how do you isolate them from each other? So. Yeah, I, I think they may be relevant for the way you're doing your separation, which is totally fine. Um, one other question I had um, from one of our chat channels is, uh, are you looking to hire any FreeBSD developers? We uh, we actually just uh, found and recruited a superstar FreeBSD developer not too long ago. Um, so not currently, uh, but we may be in the near future so uh feel free to uh shoot over uh contact information and uh certainly reach out if and when the time comes okay and then we have another question on zoom um i think they're asking what qualifies as a security boundary for you is it just different real hardware a hypervisor or a jail so uh couple things um and it, it depends on you know there, there's a couple of different ways to look at security right so our, our network is segmented uh based on different types of services there's services that are publicly available um and when i say publicly they're still uh behind the firewall um for example apache bind uh post fix that there's a direct path from the outside world to the inside world um, that is on its own vlan every one of those uh 
services is running on its own dedicated server. Um, we are not making use of jails today. Um, I did previously uh, at a at a uh, past company, and they worked tremendously well. Um, at the time that we uh, were utilizing the jail system, it was you know a little bit more of a bootstrapped operation where uh, we couldn't just go buy you know whatever hardware that we we needed um, or whatever you know virtual environments that we needed. Uh, additionally, or you know, so on on top of that, you know the there's VLAN segmentation between different layers of security. So, you know, system management runs in its own VLAN, uh, public facing services runs in its own VLAN, uh, what we call the cardholder data environment, which is anywhere that cardholder data uh, exists in transit or uh, is persisted is in its own VLAN. And then every one of those services is running on its own um, on its own hardware, its own server. Uh, we're not using uh, hypervisors internally today. Um, I have certainly made the, uh, and if anyone runs into this, um, feel free to reach, reach out to me. I've, I've certainly made the argument with uh, PCI security assessors that you can segment the guest OS from the host OS um through a variety of uh different settings and uh we uh not not for this project but for a uh, a prior project we were able to get through a pci audit running inside of a virtualized environment um where that virtualized environment was not pci compliant based on uh disabling you know console access um putting in a boot password, uh, using Jelly, uh, disk encryption on uh, the, the file system so that if, if somebody uh, from the host, uh, in, uh, the host OS, there was a compromise there, it would not directly lead to a compromise of the guest OS. The, the one thing that you can't really solve for unless you know how the uh, hypervisor is configured is is the is the memory encrypted um that that's kind of the 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 one sticking point but, but there you start looking at the attack vector and how many um you know how much sensitive data is actually in memory at any given time and you know what what type of exposure could happen if the host os was compromised um you know how how significant is it so it's it's that 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 is certainly a gray area um but i i have been able to uh to argue the point and uh get get it past the uh the assessors in the past Okay, well, thank you very much, Jason, <clears throat> for your talk and all the questions and follow up and answering lots of folks' questions. Uh, thank you again. And we're going to go ahead and take our last break of the day and we'll come back for our last talk. So we'll see you awesome. all. Be over in the hallway track if folks want to hang out, and we'll be back in about 30 minutes. <laughs>